Um, I don't believe. That wasn't you? OK, never mind. OK. All right. We're, thanks, everybody. We're just waiting for a couple more of uh, my panelists to appear. And then we'll get started. I have, uh, I'm Alistair. I'm just the moderator. And I'll help oh, you. yes. Hi. Yes. Uh, nice to help me earlier this week. Yeah. I just put the recording on. So. OK. Good yeah. And Alistair, are we going to be able to show people the um, the class notes? The uh, you can share it yourself. Okay. If you want, or if you want to put it in the chat, we can. If it's a Google Doc, or I can. Sh your I think you already shared it with me, didn't you? Yeah, I I tried to yesterday. I can also sh just share the screen. Yeah, just share the screen at the bottom. That probably is the easiest. Okay. All right. Madeir. Hey, hi. I'm just waiting for a few more minutes. Let me see if I can get um, downstairs. Get the screen. Is Erin joining us? He is. Awesome. Oh, yeah, we're going to put the kids in front of screens. Okay, are you seeing my screen now? Yes, I see lots of different things. Oh dear, okay, let me uh, try to get rid of the work stuff. Okay. You guys are gonna have to bear with me because I'm not good at Zoom and doing classes over Zoom and all that stuff, so. I apologize in advance. Well, I tell you what, why don't we get started? And if there's more people uh, coming, they can. Uh, yeah, I don't see hair guests. Right, and, I, and also uh, Stefan, who I talked to last night, I know he wanted to come. Uh, Lady Harrigus, I, I, she was a little iffy, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Okay. But anyway, uh, I'm uh, Lady Julicia Ate Northcliffe, and I'm out of the Barony of the Cleflands, which is in the mid realm. And I wanted to do this class on music as service because uh, that's something that I'm very passionate about in the SCA. Um, and I had wanted to do this for an event that got canceled, of course. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to try to do it. So. Um, just to tell you a little bit about me, I play recorder, I play a little bit of psaltery, I'm trying to learn the piano now. And um, my thing is I kind of think of myself as a court musician, uh, not that I'm, I, I'm not like appointed or anything, I don't have any grand title, but you know, I, I feel like my thing is to supply music to SCA, to, to help with the ambience, to help with dancing, to help at court, um, elevations, anything that I'm asked to do, um, you know, that's what I do. So that, that's, that's my thing. So why don't we uh, have everyone else introduce themselves, my panelists. And um, I just want to say going into that, uh, this is a panel, we want a freewheeling discussion. And we've got our discussion points, which I hope you can see. And we'll go through and uh, probably after each block, I'll probably open it up for questions. So you can put them in the chat or you can um, you know, kind of raise your hand or whatever and we'll call on you because we do want everybody to give their opinions and thoughts and, and uh, experiences and everything. So why don't we start with uh, Mr. Stradwiga. Do you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Mistress Yadviga from Middle Kingdom, specifically Cinnabar, which is Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I play music, I play lots of things. Uh, I play recorders and keyboard and viola de gamba, and I'm taking sham lessons right now, and it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I've also led a choir for like a number of years. Um, I stopped when I got pregnant, so about five years ago, I haven't really led a community choir. Um, I used to play in bands all the time, but since the pandemic, and eh, not so much. Mm -hmm. All right, it's probably good for me. And Lady Siri? Uh, hi, um, and I am also from Middle Kingdom, also from Pentamir, and uh, Northwoods is my barony. And uh, I've been teaching music for 35 years as a 
as my regular job. And I play recorders. I have a little group called the Roaring Wastrels that um, uh, varies in its like uh, numbers all the time. And uh, Baroness Gwendolyn and I did a class at uh, Virtual Val Day. And we realized that we had put together more than 20 balls. We're thinking about 25 or more um, our, our dance sets or whatever in our uh, relationship. And that was pretty cool. And I invented the coral ball and along with uh, Master Jamie Blackcloak of Canada. And um, so I'm the one who does that. And I did one stint as the crystal ball band director. And I was really excited about that. Okay, great. Is Master Aaron with us? I am here. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Aaron. Aaron Drummond from Cinnabar as well. In fact, just downstairs from Mistress Yaja. And music wise in the in the SCA, I edited the Penzik pile, which is a collection of dance music that we use at Penzik for a number of years. And I was in charge of organizing musicians for Penzik balls for a number of years, as well as uh, our long running dance event here in Cinnabar Terpsichore at the tower. I play violin, I sing, recorders, hurdy-gurdy, sham, other stuff too. Um, also perform with uh, my band from time to time, but I think that's about it. Okay. Do we have uh, Vicant Stefan? Stefan, are you with us? I just got here. Yay, hi. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh. Uh Hi. Well, I've uh, been active since I think it was AS9 <laughs> in Drock and Vald. And then because I was in the Air Force, uh, ended up in, uh, I've also been in Kaid and then retired here in Natenveld, which by the way, it's 68 degrees here, folks. Oh, great. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as according to a Master Fahrenheit. <laughs> and uh, and they're currently here in the barony of Tariskathir, which is mundanely Tucson. But I met uh, the, the Lady Jalicia at the wonderful 50th anniversary celebration that I hosted by the middle, had a wonderful time. And I'm very honored and pleased that she asked me to uh, participate. Oh, great. Yeah, we had a great time at 50 years. That was amazing. Uh, Lady Harrogate, are you here? Is she able to join us? I am. Hey, good. Hey. Hey. I, I, I was very excited to see the list of panelists just because I'm very happy to see all of you again. Hello. Hey, it's <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> so uh, greetings from the, um, the middle of the Middle Kingdom, uh, in the middle of the Midlands in the Middle Kingdom. I'm from the Shire of Balina Scolari in Illinois. Um, my name, uh, my uh, musical background is that the next thing that we wanted to tell about yeah. um uh started out as a player in modern band orchestra um and uh somebody handed me a recorder no uh M master christian hiver handed me a recorder at an event and said you might be interested in you said you were interested in music do you want to give it a go and they're suddenly dragging me into playing music for the feast the very same day that i learned how to play the recorder <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> uh and uh, uh i i was smitten i i hadn't previously run into much music in the sca and since it is something i have always loved i just dove right in and uh, play recorders still um, and am a part of a recorder consort outside of the SCA and um, also play keyboards and, um, and some percussion. And uh, one might know me uh, for lots and lots and lots of playing with dance bands since the days of the Yarvetler Music Guild in, um, in what's now uh, North Shield, and also uh, was a uh, Kapellmeisterin for uh, several years at Crystal Ball, 
and on, and I was super sad to have missed the one that Siri ran, which she had to do because I couldn't be there. <laughs> but it sounded like it was so fun. <laughs> the substitute. <laughs> I, 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 I managed the class quite well. <laughs> Lady Jalicia, if I may add, I didn't know any background. I'll, I'll do it brief. I first saw the SCA in 1972 on the campus of the University of Arizona. And they were doing a demo in front of the student union. And I watched for like 30 seconds. And I remember hearing some guy saying, the victor, Lord so-and-so. I said, what a bunch of zanies, you know, I just and walked on. And then, but later, uh, when I was active duty, I walked into a music store in Denver, Colorado, you know, bought a $5 recorder and a $6 book and taught myself to play. And then I was stationed in Germany. And now I'm looking for it. I mean, I want it. Hey, where is it? Well, that was way before the internet. So a couple of years went by. And uh, in one of the maintenance bays, I was the, OA, the officer. There was this tech sergeant there. And, and we're just killing time because we're inspecting a bunch of stuff. And we're just chatting. And there was a three-day weekend coming the next week. And I think this was a Tuesday. <laughs> and I was just making conversations. Well, do you have any plans for this weekend? He goes, well, I'm a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism. And I'm going to a coronet attorney. And I go, where? Where? Where is it? Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, give me a phone number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and of course, it was in a <clears throat> real castle by Darmstadt. <laughs> and so I went there and I've been hooked ever since. But I finally stumbled across somebody. Yeah, oh, that's great, that's great. Well, listen, I'm gonna to try to move along here uh, because we were already 15 minutes into this. Um, I will say if anybody wants this, uh, I guess it's the class handout, uh, you can contact me later and I'll send it to you. I also have a list of resources, SCA musical resources. And if anybody wants that, again, um, I'd be happy to shoot it to you. But I wanna start off with a definition of music as service. And I'm sure this everyone has their own definition, but this is mine. That is music, instrumental, or vocal that enhances the period atmosphere of SCA events and provides entertainment to large or small groups. And of course, we know that music is very period, uh, that music was part of an aristocratic education. Noble families employed musicians to perform at private services, feasts, entertainments. There was music in all kinds of court ceremonies, tournaments, funerals, weddings, coronations, everything. So that's why we need it in the SCA. Uh, because it adds to the overall amb ambiance or atmosphere. Uh, we can have court performances, which are vocal or instrumental. Uh, coronations and elevations need music. Of course, dance. Uh, you can have groups, baronial and local groups. And then there's also all the Pensic groups that form there. And then there's also teaching classes, uh, encouraging others to expand their repertoire and enhance their SCA experience. Um, so, with that being said, do the panelists want to add anything or uh, uh, Stefan is raising his hand, go ahead. I like the first bullet here and why we need, uh, without question, whether it's a formal performance or just, I, there's little doubt no matter what group our, our visitors and our friends are here, that there's a pickup group, people just sit and basically jam, which is fine, you know, providing background. And I don't, and I do it every event, whether it's myself or a couple of us are just sitting and playing. I don't care if it's a, whatever you know an outdoor event that it's rare for one or two gentles at the end of it to come up and thank us and say yeah. oh thank you for the wonderful music oh it adds so much and we smile graciously well thank you it's our pleasure we glad you we're glad you liked it but i'm wondering if other people who do you're just sitting jamming with a couple other people and to me it does add to the ambience it does add to the atmosphere and i actually think it's basically essential yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always like floored when people come up and thank me for playing. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> I love this. You don't have to thank me to do it. Um, anyone else want to chime in? Yeah. Um, don't you remember that you and I uh, were practicing at Tiger Hunt and people were thinking we were yeah. performing? Yeah. We were just playing stuff we were going to play later. That at, and that, at, that I think that's really funny. And we don't always tell people that we're doing that. We just, you know, let them believe what they will. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah there, we'll discuss later performance versus just jamming. And like I said, people will walk up to you. They think they're performing, but you're just jamming. But you smile graciously. Oh, thank you. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't. I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I just really want to encourage everybody to get out there and play. You know, I've never had anybody um, 
react negatively. I mean, even when I was beginning and I could barely play hot cross buns, people are still impressed. You know, they really are. So just do it. Just get out there and do it. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, we I'm just going to add a quick addition, if I could, too, in that um, one really great thing about jamming or uh, planned performances is um, they tend to be the place that really draws in the attention and um, desire to participate in the SCA of children. Uh, okay. They're one of the best uh, audience members ever and um, it's uh, it, and a lot of people that are at the SCA event aren't necessarily tailored exactly for them. So uh, music can be kind of a thing that makes their day. If I may add, we meet on my barony often, well, 90% uh, at a city park and that's one of the larger parks and people will wander up and just, you know, kind of wondering what's this zaniness. And there's been about three times where someone wanders up mundane clothes and listens to our music and well, we say, oh, how are you? And we start chatting with them. Did you play? Well, I play a little guitar. And so, you know, well, you'd like to join us? Well, okay. And, you know, he's reading the chords on there. And we've gotten three people into the barony, into music that way. They were just wandering through the park. We were nice to them. We invited them to sit in. And within probably five minutes, we hooked them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I always travel with an extra recorder so I can say here, you know. Okay, so now we're going into ways to add music. We all agree that we need music, our events need music. How, how can you slot it in? Where are the places where you can make yourself useful? And so the first we want to talk about is court. Um, you can do it prior to court. Uh, you can do it during, you can do it after. I have a recorder group, a uh, local recorder group that I founded it. And uh, like Harowith said, it, it's attendance goes up and down, up and down. What we do is something that I call prelude to court where we'll play, um, we'll prepare like eight to 10 songs and we'll play them during that time when people are standing around, they're bored, nothing's happening. Um, but then we also will play as the, um, as the Royals are coming down. And I tell you, that's really impressive. If you can play while they're progressing in and as, and as they take their seats and everything, it really, really adds a lot. But there's, um, there's pros and cons. And Siri, I know you were in a group one time where you were playing, you were tasked with playing during court. So can you talk about yeah. that a little bit? Um, yeah, we're, our Roaring Wastels played for all but three of the courts of Rongvald or Narabella. Uh, the third reign and we started off with big guns you know, we had all our instruments and then we realized that that was going to be just too loud and I'm going to use the word obtrusive because it, so we ditched the soprano recorder over time we decided that we were all going to play the just the tenor recorder and keep things like uh, in the background so that it's not interfering with with the business of court um, and we also decided that playing from the back of the venue was going to work out better um, even though the people in the back are in the back so they can chit chat I know I'm I'm kind of you know mm -hmm. uh, you know let letting you know that um, and then there we got a little bit of shushing here and there but you know they got used to it because the king and queen had requested that we do it and so that was a lot of fun. We got a lot of experience and we learned a lot of music. So I, I felt that that was a very valuable experience for us. One thing, I'm okay. sorry, go ahead, Jalicia. No, Erin and then Judge Wiga, I wanted to get her in. She hadn't said anything yet. Sure. One thing I wanted to say about adding music to events is that it's really important to coordinate with whoever's in charge of the space that you're in. It can be a really frustrating experience to go to an event, be prepared with your instrument, say, I'm going to play, and then being told that your music doesn't fit with somebody else's vision. And it's off, it can be really very dispiriting. And so if you're able to coordinate ahead of time and understand what the expectations are, it'll be a, a better experience for everybody. Um, the, the other thought I had there is about when you are playing at an event and injecting your music into an event, I find that people are usually much more appreciative if they are not forced to listen to the music, if they have a choice to be there or not. Um, if you are 
you know, the court thing was, was great. I had a lot of fun doing it. I also didn't always work perfectly. And part of that is because people didn't necessarily have a choice about whether they were listening to it or not. Now, King and Queen wanted it. It was great to try it. But it's not like where you're busking at a large event and people can kind of come up and walk by and say, wow, that's really nice to hear for a little bit and then walk on. Yeah, yeah. Judge Vega, do you want to add anything? Sure. So I was going to say something similar to what Aaron said, which is that if you can coordinate with the Herald ahead of time and be on the same team, then it will be much better. Every time we've had a great experience playing for court, it's because the Herald was actually in charge and we were on the same team with the Herald. So like we could get cues about when things are going to happen. And that was really good. We've also had a lot of good experience with playing before court because before court is like often the venues for court are great for playing music. Like they're often in a church sanctuary. Um, and because of that, people are also like not as loud and rowdy. So if people, you can usually find a place where people can hear you better often. Okay, great, great. Uh, anyone else, do any of our uh, other participants want to join in with uh, thoughts? I've got another uh, place for adding music also. Um, I did a, a stint in a couple of different uh, largish choirs in the SCA and with, um, uh, and with the uh, Warwick Consort. And we found that um, choosing a time during the event for a timed concert was something that worked out pretty well for um, if you actually were interested in having people listen rather than being background music. Right, that's a good idea. I'm gonna write that down. The gentle lady with the harp, would you like to say something? Sure, I'm Telenor. Um, I have been performing court music in the West for seven or eight years now at basically almost every single court. The one that I think of that I didn't do it at was the one where I was on the agenda being elevated as a laurel for playing court music. So I had a little bit of things going on. I couldn't quite do it. But my point I wanted to make was for me anyway, it is not a performance. I am not what people are there to look for. I'm doing the background music. I'm adding a little bit of ambience. The nice thing about something like this is that the dynamic range is massive. I can fill the room with it. I can make it so the person next to me can't hardly hear it. And, yeah. and so, you know, I also play woodwinds, but I do that in service of doing dance, uh, dance music, because there you want everybody to hear each of the cues, you want them to hear the beat. And, and for this, it's a diff the, 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 the court music is vastly different. Um, the, the only time that I have ever had, I always, always at the, when the, when the, when their majesties, um, when, the, when their royal highnesses have recently won crown, I, I meet them and I say, hey, this is what I do. You've seen me do it. Do you want me to continue doing it? Um, the only time I've ever had even a caveat on that was, yes, but we like lots of bardic. And so we're gonna have people coming and singing. So if you could wait until after they're done singing before you kick in so that you don't confuse them with what they're going through in their mind before the their bardic presentation, that's the only kind of like, um, knob to turn down, as it were. I wouldn't call it negative feedback at all, but it's the only time where everybody said, yeah, yeah, just hold off a bit. It's really welcomed all across the board. Okay, uh, the lady, I'm sorry, people don't have their names in their boxes, the woman with the glasses and then Stefan. Thank you, perhaps you mean me. Uh, Margaret Norwood from Margaret, Barry there, yeah. in Chicago, uh, formerly manager of Court and Country, which is a choral group uh, that's been we just hit our 10th anniversary. I left the group right as the pandemic hit. So that's why I'm former. Um, but one of the cool things that we did back in the early days when the group started out with basically four women, that's all we had. And we had a rule that if any two of us were at any SC event, we had to, we had to offer to perform. And most right. of the time they took us up on it. And as the group started getting larger and larger, we also ended up moving uh, outside of the SCA. But that cardinal rule in the early days got us a lot of performance time and and got us uh, got us a little bit more uh, um, appreciation profile, higher profile. Yeah, that's great. So that's great. you know, like I said, it was a cardinal rule of our director, uh, Tulare, 
that if any two of us were at an event, if we didn't volunteer to perform, and preferably more than two, but at least two, uh, she was going to give us what for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. Stefan, and then I think we're going to have to move on because we've got a lot to cover. But Well, here ahead. about the court, I think without question, I've never had a problem in Three Kingdoms. The 10, 12 minutes before court, whatever your little pickup group, you play right up before court. And I've never had a complaint. Now, of course, if you're going to do something during court, you without question check with the court herald and coordinate. But what we do, and it's my idea, and I think people love it, is we have a piece. Okay, we're sitting in the courts coming up. We have a piece up on our music stands. And at the final, you know, this hereby closes. Huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. At the last huzzah, we launch into something, you know, within 10 seconds. It's usually bright, da, 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 and everybody loves it. But you, you know, you don't sit there, well, let's play something, let's play something. We have it on our stands and at the, at the last of the huzzahs, we launch into it and people love it. It, it, it adds a, a joyous end to the court. So I, I would recommend it. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Now here's the other uh, big thing is feast. Are you going to do, uh, and, and that's another common time when you know music is appreciated, um, but are you going to do background music? Are you gonna do a performance? And then um, if you really want to get fancy, you can do music from a specific time and place. Like if the feast is 15th century Italian, you can do all 15th century Italian um, music. Um, there was a feast at 50 year that was all, I think it was Greek and we did all Greek music. That was really, really- That was something else. Yeah, that was fun. It really was, that was, it, about, that was good. Yeah. Um, anyone want to talk about pros and cons for playing at feast? Oh, oh God, I that one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Aaron cool. and Harry Gwith. Sure. So I really love doing background music at Feast. I think for me, the thing to really think about is making sure that I'm moving around the room so that it's not kind of one table who's only hears the music. Um, the other thing to really carefully consider is what kind of music you're playing during Feast, what instrumentation you're using. Um, vocal music might not work as well as recorder or harp. You know, Sean would probably be too overpowering for a feast. So really thinking about the space that you're in and, and what instrumentation you're doing and recognizing that, you know, what you have to offer might not always work for the environment you're in, but you can always find an environment where what you can do will work. Okay, Herigrith, I think you want to chime in. Yeah, uh, well, I just also, um, before I say my piece, I wanted to let you know that there is a participant with a hand raised, uh, Tracy? Yes. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, Tracy, I didn't see you. Uh, oh, that's Tracy? okay. She yeah, I'll just go on after whoever's on now. Okay, Herigwith and then Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, it's Signe, but yes, I haven't, I couldn't change the name. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, um, I know that this was a thing that came up in a later part of your outline as well, uh, specifically about um, performances during a feast uh, and how mm, not everybody has a vision of uh, an SCA feast as being a place where they need to uh, be attentive to the entertainment. Um, and I would definitely advise against having a performance lengthy enough that um, your group is actually the, the only thing going on during the feast, during the entire time of it. Uh, if you have spoken word, dialogue, a play, things that aren't gonna mean anything to anyone if they can't hear well, if lots of people are talking over their food, which is to a totally normal activity to do. And, um, it, it was the worst performance experience, I think, in my SCA experience, was putting on a play with uh, singing and lots of elaborate costuming and realizing that before we were even halfway through, uh, the king was starting a bread ball fight out of boredom. Um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> I, I highly recommend to either be ambient or make your performance a small part of the feast. 
Okay, Tracy has been waiting. Tracy? Oh, yeah. Um, was just something to uh, be aware of. Um, if you are playing for a feast or a court or something like this, and you've got some non-SCA members playing with you, some people from your local recorder group, which I have, prep them beforehand and get them ready to be interrupted in the middle of something. Mm. Um, I usually say, well, this will give you a real flavor of being a court musician. Um, and, you know, you, the king may interrupt you at any time. And uh, uh, because they're accustomed to doing a, a performance where everybody is listening, generally. Um, whereas I mundanely am a harpist, another harpist, and I'm used to people interrupting me. Uh, <laughs> it, it just happens. Um, and the, uh, um, I had something else to say and I can't remember. It couldn't have been that important, but yeah. Um, remind your new people who've never done it, uh, that they can be, oh yes, they can be interrupted. The other thing that, um, I've used with good effect is to do background music, but arrange with the crown, the king or the queen are especially appropriate for this to have them call for a command performance. Oh. And shut everybody up for one or two pieces. Yeah. Um, it, and uh, that, that you know, maybe bring, if it's a, bring the, you know, whoever the musicians up toward the head table. Mm -hmm. um, and that will usually shut them up. And uh, then you bow and thank, you know, and take off and do you, either finish finish some background music or go eat. <laughs> That's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Um, uh, Stefan? Uh, some of the gentles have touched upon what I'm going to say. Uh, definitely like court, touch base with the Feast Herald. You know, touch base so you get a little idea of what the program is going to be. And we have a great working relationship here. It's understood. Again, there could be three or four of us just playing background music. He'll come up to see, just gives us a signal and we we shut down because he, he's going to make an announcement or whatever, and we totally understand. And I may be uh, dating myself, but from my times in Drakenwald and all that, when the Herald announced a group, it was part of their structured entertainment, whether it was a poet, a bard, a juggler, a sketch. Gentles were expected to, you know, the voice of the, the, the prince, the voice of the king, and they were expected to be polite for announced entertainment that was part of the structure of the feast. And so, uh, but definitely touch base. We have no problem. We're just happily sitting over there playing background music and we get the signal. Of course, we, we stop immediately because something's going to happen. And we totally understand that. Yeah, I, I think flexibility is key. It really is, it really is. Um, all right, does anyone else have any, uh, any other comments? So, uh, yeah, well, we did, um, the Northwoods did a, an event called the Grand Tour, and we did two of them, one, uh, those Grand Tour of the 13th century, and another, the Grand Tour of the 15th century, and it was centered around a feast, but we, uh, our group did music the entire day, and then we also performed the entire feast. They fed us, too, which was, it was really well-organized event. We really liked it, but we were, uh, basically providing that that we are kind of emerged into the 13th century so all of the music was 13th century and all the food was 13th century and that was pretty good but those events are rare that you know the the uh, uh, the autocrat is requesting that there be music throughout the entire feast and so um it, usually when i've been involved in a feast it was you know by request and I have, we have had, uh, I think someone mentioned a vocal, um, when it's time for a vocal uh, performance, uh, it does, it, it doesn't lend itself to performing while people are eating. So yeah, having someone say, um, let's listen to this person sing because, you know. Yeah, that is a great idea. Uh, let's move on to performing solo. And there's lots of things here to think about. Um, are you going to do something impromptu versus rehearsed? Um, show me. If I may add on this, I was going to add, this also applies, applies to uh, ensembles. I provided some of these bullets. Solo or ensembles, a lot of this stuff applies for both. Right, 
Right, right, yeah. Uh, gauging the theme of your event, gauging your audience, uh, volume, song performance, and length, um, all these things come into account. So which of these do you think is the most important or, or uh, you know, the, the ones that people should consider? All of the above. Yeah. If I, if I may comment, because the first bullet impromptu and it's up there, there's nothing wrong with impromptu or busking and all that, but as a general rule, I would recommend you say that for more of a, a bardic circle type venue. If it's a, a feast, uh, I, have, I have nothing against you know, bards, poets, and entertainers, but I think it should be something you feel very comfortable with. You at least you've semi polished it, and so you can do a, a semi, you know, and also with you'll have more confidence. Hopefully, you won't bomb. So uh, impromptu is great for informal stuff at a feast. I would recommend any gentle habits be something you've you've pretty polished. I mean, you 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 have confidence that you're going to do a pretty good show. Yeah, yeah. Aaron, um, how should somebody decide uh, about their song or performance length? How do you gauge that? Oh, you're specifically asking me performance length. That's an interesting question. I mean, I think it really has to do with with what your goal is. Are are you actually standing up and performing? Have you been given a spotlight and attention? If so, you know, maybe three minutes at a feast max. If you're kind of been invited to do something during court, you know, if, I wouldn't go much more than that. If you're at some kind of, you know, showcase where there's a bunch of people going, maybe three things, 10 minutes, maybe 15 at the most, but um, you know, I would be very careful not to kind of hog the spotlight. Um, and of course, if you're doing background music or busking, it can kind of do whatever you want because people don't have to give you, give you their attention. Yeah. Tracy, do you have your hand up again? No, I think, I think I just accidentally hit that. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, Herewith, uh, what would you say about volume? How do I, you know, we all tell people to be louder, but that's kind of hard to do. Do you have any tips about that? Um, it has so much to do with how big the room is if you're indoors or um, how, uh, how far away the, the back end of the people who are listening are in the outdoor venue. And yeah. um, uh, boy, you know, there, there are instruments that are louder and softer and those you might need to choose instrumentation based on where you're at so that um, it will either not overpower um, other things that are supposed to be happening in, at the same time or, or so that it will fill the room if you need say processional music to be grand and inspiring you know don't uh, don't play it on flutes uh, because they're ju just not going to give that impact in the same way that uh, a, a big group of shams can do for that sort of an occasion. And um, boy, it's uh, if one really wants to uh, it, be as close as possible to being heard, um, stand close to the audience and try to have more of it to your sides and occasionally lean from side to side, especially for a vocal performance so that everybody hears most of it and, and not to have um, all the, uh, yourself at the very end of a long audience that's going to be a fair distance away from you. Uh, just to mm. help yourself out with um, uh, not having to project uh, quite as much of a distance. Yeah, I think you have to look at your music too, because I know with Recorder, one of my favorite songs starts off very low and those little notes are soft. I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. And then as the song goes along, it gets higher and louder, but I just have to remember that probably no one's going to hear me until maybe the 10th measure when it gets higher. Stefan? If I can offer on this, this was my, is, I've, I've, I've done this many times, especially for like Twelfth Night or a Feast. Ask a friend of yours to be like a half or two thirds of the way when they know you're going to be. Now, this is assuming it's going to be a scheduled performance. And they, they unobtrusively, they're back there and they can give you a little higher. They can give you a, 
They can give you an unobtrusive hand signal so you can control your volume and that works really well. And so, be, you know, you can have a shield out there. It's not unusual for us with our ensemble is gonna play during setup is we'll actually do a semi sound check as somebody be in the back of the room. Idea, but yeah. somebody somebody actually during your performance can be giving you subtle hand signals about your volume. Okay. Anyone else want to join in? Have you on, this, on this whole block? Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw another gentleman talking about showmanship, and I I said a lot of it. You know, it comes from experience, but even you should uh, try to encourage even your beginners to try to hook your audience, engage them. You know, act like you know what you're doing and here's my show and you're going to love it. And a lot of it is experience, but you know, like the, I saw a comment, look this way at your audience. If you're singing or playing, look this way, hook your audience. And a lot of it does come from experience, but we should encourage beginning performers to do that. You've got to engage your audience. And if you engage your audience, you're probably going to be successful. That's uh, actually what I just said in the chat. <clears throat> I've been putting some comments in the chat when, when you guys were talking that making eye contact and connecting with your audience is super important for solo performance. Yeah. I was in a, uh, a class once on performance and the guy who was, I think, semi-pro, basically, he was very, very uh, experienced. He sang a song and he looked at each person, each one of us in the class, and he drew us all in. It was just amazing. To, you know, that's that's what you have to do. If I can relate a tale on this, I was asked to judge something at Astray or uh, for youth. And there was a young uh, gentleman about 15 and he sang about a three minute saga, but he was, I could tell he was always looking up cause he's trying to remember the words. And so I counseled him, I gave him feedback afterward. Uh, it's part of that, you know, try to be prepared. And in the last two years, he has done so well. He's being recognized, he's winning awards. Cause now he's, he's, he's looking at this part of that, uh, and then I went over there, and then over there, there, and he's adding that animation, that presence. And now he's being recognized and winning awards. So again, we need to encourage exactly that. Hook your audience, engage them, look them in the eye. Exactly, exactly. All right, any other comments? Because, uh, ooh, we've only got 10 minutes left and we've got probably oh. the biggest one to talk about is starting a vocal or instrumental group. <laughs> How to find like-minded musicians? Uh, Facebook. Where Pardon? Facebook. The census says that 80% of the SCA gets their information from Facebook. And that's where you start. Um, you know, word of mouth, of course, is important. But people look at their Facebook. And they look at, you know, various groups that they're interested in. And that's basically where you start when you want to communicate with people, when you want to meet them, when you want to get information to them or about them, you go to Facebook. I don't. Yeah, I don't think well, that's I know not everybody does. This is for SCA, right? So we have about 17 minutes. 17 minutes. Right. Okay. I'm not saying that it is a 100%, you know, it'll reach every person. It won't. But I'm just saying that most of the SCA people will be reading their Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Judge Wiga, uh, did you have something to chime in? Yeah, I guess if, in terms of finding people, you know, in the before times, I would go to an SCA, like my local group, and start playing music. And hopefully some people would come up and be like, oh, I would love to also play music. Like, that's how I've always found people in the, like, yeah. I mean, I haven't had to find a new group in a long time, but yeah, yeah. My, my go problem, dance practice and be like, hey, I can play some dance music and then they will come. Yeah, yeah. Hergwith, I think you have a group, don't you? What, what's your experience been? Uh, not having necessarily been the founder of a group, um, that's a that's a, a bit of a new that would be a bit of a new thing for me. I've, I've founded a lot of um, jam groups. That just, hey, there's a person I know who likes to sing and there's a person I know who plays an instrument and let's all meet up at 3 p.m. in somewhere and have a good time making some music uh, and then go our separate ways to the four winds at the end of that time that was fun. And, um, 
and and uh, I I think just looking here at the handout, one one bit that's really essential is knowing um, if if you want to found a group, do you also want to have to teach music? Um, if you want to do that, that is a great way for um, making new musicians happen in your area that will probably uh, go on and do great and wonderful things even beyond your group. If you are not intending to teach music, do not have your group be everyone is welcome. Make sure it's an invitation only group if you don't intend to teach. Okay, great. Uh, the gentleman with her hand up. I thank you. That's me again. Yes, yes. Uh, and as, the, as again, former manager of Court and Country, when and we went from four to at our biggest thirteen people, I can tell you that uh, what we did, and it was primarily by me, the token extrovert, is any time somebody indicated that they liked our music, any time anybody indicated that they had any interest, skill, experience whatsoever of anything musical, I asked them if they wanted to join the group. I never let an opportunity go by where I did not follow up on any shred of interest that anybody explained. That's actually what drove the group to be two thirds non SCA and one third SCA because a lot of the people that that kept getting joining the group were not SCA. And I can tell you half the group isn't on Facebook or is only barely on Facebook. So Facebook would not have worked for us. It was all live contact. But the whole key is just act like a salesman. And yes, you need a token extrovert. But if somebody <laughs> expresses any interest, you follow up on it. And then you have to stay, make sure that you keep the communication going. If someone expresses interest, you follow up. If they aren't, if it isn't a good time when you first talk to them, you, you make, a, you make a, a note to follow up with them and email them. And don't be a pest, but make sure that you're, you're persistent with your communication until they, at some point where they indicate that it's just not a right fit for them in the end, then you drop them off. But the key is you have to have good communication and you have to follow up on any bit of interest if you're trying to grow your group. If you're not, that's a whole different story. But if that's your goal is to grow the group, you it works. I can tell you 100% it works because that's what I did. And 80% of the group came directly from me doing that. Right. That's a really good point about recognizing and um, inviting talent when you see it just around. That's, that's a great. Yeah, Stefan. And part of this, Facebook is okay. Emails, I mean, spread the word. But no, it's like the expression, nothing succeeds like success. It's nothing succeeds like exposure. The more you play, the more you're visible, the more you're going to be noticed, the more people are going to show an interest. So I wouldn't be shy about, you know, getting out and playing. And if anybody, what the, the other gentleman said, if anybody shows the least bit of interest, you show interest in them. You never know when you're going to find a, a gem, you know, someone who is just going to be a, a, a wonderful dynamic addition to your ensemble. So get out and play. Yeah, I, I want to throw out a, a problem that I've had and, and see what our panelists and, and everyone thinks. We'll have a group of people uh, who are like, you know, intermediate, you know, whatever, and we're practicing a group of songs. And then we get another person who uh, is maybe not quite so far along. They're maybe more of a beginner. And it seems like we have to start back from zero, from ground zero, teaching them the songs, getting them up to speed, Meanwhile, everyone else is bored because they know the songs and, and we have to, you know, take everything back to a, a slow pace, a slow tempo and everything. Um, but, but I, you know, like Siri and many of you, I, I don't want to ever turn anyone away and say, well, you can't join us, you know, or whatever. We don't want to go through this the, the zillionth time. So how do you deal with that when you have people that are kind of at, at two different levels? How do you make everyone merge? Yeah, here with. Uh, yeah, so this was a thing that happened all the time in uh, Yara Veller Music Guild because it was everyone is welcome. Um, then uh, everyone might not even start by owning their own instrument or having a fantastic voice. But uh, there, the solution that people came up with uh, before I arrived um, was a in a two hour time block for practicing together, the first hour was considered JV hour. So that would be the teaching time. The second hour would be for um, playing. 
playing through new things, sight reading, uh, doing something that's a bit of more of a technical challenge for the more uh, advanced musicians. Your JV people may be able to participate if they're able to simplify the parts, but um, that, but they're not required to stay if they're not ready for that yet. And um, as long as there's a sufficient number of people in both groups um, that they can have crossover as people feel more confident with their playing and singing. And, um, and then people who uh, have an interest as a more advanced musician in uh, teaching other people can be there for the first hour but they're not required to be if that's not really their thing. Okay, great, great. Aaron and Judge Vigo, yeah, do you guys have any ideas along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried a lot of different variations on this over the years, and I'm sure Yaja will have stuff to say too, but regarding kind of playing for, for dancing, um, a couple of things that, that we've tried doing is kind of having weekly practices before our big dance event where people who weren't as comfortable with the music could come and practice and learn the music, but then others might still show up and play the day of. Um, and, and kind of the same thing, even if, if all we have time for is a practice the day of at the event, that can still be helpful for musicians who might not be familiar with the music um, and wouldn't just feel comfortable dropping in right away. Um, but still, and then honestly, even for, for more experienced musicians, that can be helpful just to know what keys are we playing in? What roadmaps are we using? So things don't come as a surprise during the ball. So I, I know Siri and Hergith have also uh, done that kind of thing. Highly recommend that. Yeah, yeah um, I, with the Roaring Wastrels, we have had a couple of musicians uh, come join us who are either new to their instrument or um, they're just new to like the dance community. And what I've, I've actually done is I've gone to their house and worked with them individually. So that's one, that's one solution, but it's not practical to do that all the time. Yeah, another thing that's hard is to have a repertoire group where you are learning a big group of songs that everybody knows. Cause then when you get a new person, they have to like learn the whole repertoire and it can be overwhelming and they feel bad. So what I did, because I like learning new music, is we would just be constantly learning new music and would rarely go back to old stuff. And so at least everybody is learning new music. And so in that sense, the new person isn't that far behind everyone else. Yeah. But it's definitely hard with dealing with the difficulty levels. Right. Of course, then that disappointed the people who had learned the repertoire and were comfortable with that and didn't particularly want to learn new music. So you, <laughs> can, you cannot please everyone, unfortunately. Right, 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 yeah. Uh, anyone else have ideas, things they want to? Okay. I play in an ensemble here called the Merry Minstrels. There's seven of us, only three are SCA, but bless the heart, the other four are willing to play for major events. Like we've been invited for 12th nights. They played at my elevation mm -hmm. and they're really good sports about it. But we strive to have, and we also give school demos, we strive to have a, a core repertoire of about oh, 15, 16 songs that we're just nailed. We could, we could meet and, and nail it, but we also explore new music too. So I think maybe on ensemble, you should strive to have a, an emergency core at short notice. You could cover something and then by all means also explore new music. All right, great, great. Another well, that you can do is um, do what our Laurel did at Road Beyond in Chicago, which is you have a sight reading group and it's just sight reading all the time. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to play all of the notes. You can just play like one or two. And if you get that, that's great. And eventually you'll get better. And if you can commit to that, then that can be okay too. All right, great. Anyone, I'm getting the five minute uh, sign. Um, so while we open it up, we had a couple more things to talk about, like how to find repertoire. And um, I'll put my email at the top of this, um, what I'm sharing. So you can email me if you wanna see uh, my, uh, my resource list. And then uh, dealing with negativity. I mean, these are some things that I've heard, <laughs> um, you know, that people don't wanna listen to a performance at feast, um, feeling like, only the most talented, wonderful people should ever perform. And I don't want to listen to someone who maybe is just starting out or isn't, you know, extremely wonderful. And um, 
you know, oh, preference for using recorded songs rather than live music. And Siri, I know you say that that that, that really is the, the preference of the dance mistress or master. Yeah, dance, uh, dance, uh, they have their own preference, like they have a favorite recording and they should be, you know, allowed to use it, you know, um, using live musicians means you can change tempos and that kind of a thing. It, either, both of them have their uh, pluses and minuses. Yeah. If I, if I may speak here in Aitenbelt, we're trying to finish our, our Aitenbelt vault of, you know, the 101 graded, well, uh, the, 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 the repertoire, because I'm sure you've all experienced this, you come in an event, let's play a song and somebody has it in C and somebody has it in G and we're trying to uh, standardize it. But we put the front part of the book will be like the top 20 Aitenveld favorite, you know, greatest hits for uh, dance. And that's our first chapter. And we have absolutely touched base with the dance master and dance mistress. And so we're in sync with how they teach it. And the balance of the book will just be our favorites. But yeah, if you're gonna play dance music, definitely touch base with who's ever going to be, you know, coordinating the dance. Right, right, right. Okay, does anyone else have any uh, final words or thoughts? Let's hear from some of our uh, participants, our students. Is anyone, um, you can just share a memory or something that's worked well for you or hasn't worked or anything you'd like to say? Oh, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing your name. You with your yes, t t there's a telling of yes. Um, I'm out in the west. I used to live in the Clefflands, but that's been a long time ago. <laughs> and one of the things that I've found is that in in environments where there's a, a welcome everybody kind of a thing, there's there's places where the people who are new and just learning the instrument um, can can be part of the group. But there's places where, like in a full on performance, you want to go to the more senior members of the group. And so we kind of had like an a, a apprentice and master or journeyman kind of behavior between these two parts of the group. And so, you know, on the big tutti when everybody's in it, great. On the more solo -y parts, not so much everybody. So these are the kind of things that, that, that we were able to use successfully in places like um, International Society of Folk Harpers and Crafters to get togethers. Okay, great. Did you ever have hurt feelings though? How do you is it, is it ever awkward to tell people, well, lay out for this part or? No, it was kind of the other way. It was, you start with, you know, you, 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 you find what you can do and then over time you grow. Okay. And so, got it, T, or Alistair, I'm sorry, Monday name, got a drink. Anyway, so you find what you can do as you can grow. Um, you know, at, at first, you know, I'd sit in the back and play, you know, just, I got that, I got the drone note. Oh, okay, now I can get, you know, and eventually you work up to where you can get through the whole thing. And it wasn't an enforced you don't play, it was a play when you can. If you make an oops, you know, you maybe you ought to be a little quieter until you've got that one nailed down. But it was not um, like considered a bad thing to be a beginner. It was considered a path to become no longer a beginner. Okay, great, great, great. Anybody else? This thing about negativity, if I may, again, there's a difference between just you're just busking, cruising around. I don't worry that much about it. But again, if it's an announced performance and somebody says, I don't want to hear that, to me, okay, I'm old, I'm old fashioned. I think that's being rude to the crown and being rude to the populace, that I just want to sit and talk. You may have, I put a comment on the SCA community page or the campfire page about a month or so ago that. I may be, forgive me if I'm sounding harsh here, but people who come to a feast, paid all that money, got into the garb, and they're sitting there talking about how much they hate their boss or about the Rams-Packers game. Okay, <laughs> they have the right to do that, but, you know, at I we've always striven that a feast of, of nobles, and we're all supposed to be nobles, it did have occasional a poet, a bard, an entertainer, and when that happened, it was polite to listen, and I wish that would come back more in some of the feasts. I think we're beginning to lose that in the SCA, especially again, if a herald announces a performer as the voice of the crown, I think everybody should zip it. That's just me. All right, well, I think that's a good uh, good note to go out on. I'm, I'm being told we have one minute. Anyone else have anything burning that they wanna say or? Uh, you have or Seamus in the corner. 
corner that had something. He had his hands up for a while. Um, I think oh. that the next class doesn't start for another about 10 minutes or so. Am I wrong, uh, moderator? Uh, yeah, but we need to get off. I, um, it's because oh. I, as a moderator, have to get off so I can get everything recorded for the next le next one. Oh, okay. You know, I think you can officially go oh. on, but the, the, the um, recording is going to stop. So. Um, okay, so well, I just wanted to say that um, I'm also from the West Kingdom, and um, a lot of times, you know, having if you have some time for new people to come and play with you and meet you and play, you know, kind of, as you guys might say, jam together. A lot of times, if you're going to some other point, the new people and you kind of know what the skill levels of each other are, and mm -hmm. so a lot of times that might make it a little bit easier if you're doing maybe a more complicated piece or or something. And uh, it might be something that's beyond their skill level because you've already established a relationship with that person. And so you're not, it, it may not seem so cold, but just, you know, hey, we have this thing going on. We, this group here knows what's going on and then they can do it. And then you can join right back up when we go to some, do something else later on. Yeah. So that might be a good thing too. And yeah. it also gets people involved because you get people with all sorts of instruments who want to just have a good time and sing and play music and stuff, so. Yeah, I find that yeah. to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks. One thing that's worked with me, sometimes if I'm sitting there busking, someone will come up and, and they play another instrument or whatever. They don't know my music, but we'll alternate. Like I'll play a song and then they do a song that they know. And so we'll alternate like that. So we can, you know, we can join in. I'm not saying to them, you know, oh, I am the only one who can perform, you know, but then they're not trying to sight read my stuff or vice versa. So that that's worked well. Yeah. Okay. I think before we, we leave, I say thank you, Lady Jolicia. Uh, wonderful. Thank, thank you to all of you. Thank, thank you, you to all of you. Viva. Viva. Thank, thank you for everyone. Thank you. thank you all of you for sharing all with us. Oh, thank you to all of you.